Is Maryland working in the kitchen or something? Yes. Oh, that's what I heard. Okay. Well, I haven't looked at this yet, so let's see what we have this morning. Passion. Passion. Yes. That's interesting. Contents and some deprecation passion. All right. Well, if someone would be kind enough to read this, and then we can maybe check out a couple of points. And... Okay. Holy Lord, how little repentance there is in the world. And how many sins I have to repent of. I am troubled for my sin of passion, for the shame and horror of it as an evil. I propose to give way to it and come to thee for strength and to that end. Most men give vent to anger frequently and are overcome by it, bringing many excuses and extenuations for it. As that, it occurs suddenly. They delight not in it, that they are sorrow afterwards, that godly men. They thus seek peace after I burst of passion by entire forgetfulness of it, or by skinning over their wound, they hope for healing and peace in Christ's blood. Lord God, I know that my sudden anger arises to cross me, and I desire to keep myself by Christ. There is, there, is, there is in all wrongs and crosses double cross, that which crosses me, that which crosses thee. In all good things, there is somewhat that pleases somewhat that pleases thee. Sin is that my heart is pleased or troubled, as things please or trouble me. Without having my, without my having a regard to Christ, thus I am like Eli. The subject of punishment for not rebuking sin, whereas I should humbly confess my sin and fly to the blood of Christ in peace. Give me then repentance, true brokenness, lasting confession, for these things despise in spite of my sin. Right. Yeah. Too often we put fear before we think, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. That's, I made some checks because this will. Do you build this place? You this place? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where there's so much. Um, the passion that he's talking about, I guess, is uh, in one sense the passion of uh, outbursts of anger that we get so angry. Yeah. And there's something that he, he said here that I'm uh, helpful. A lot of times I'll find myself in need of repentance. So I'll pray and ask for forgiveness in that. But coupled to that, I've begun to always ask the Lord going forward. So not only, Lord, that I fail and I repent and I'm sorry and I, I'm, um, and I need your forgiveness for what I did wrong. I need your strength going because I know that I haven't completely put that in prison yet. And, and it's by your strength and, uh, that I can resist that. So I like the way you said that. Strength to that end. I mean, my sin is that my heart is pleased or troubled as things please or trouble. That is, uh, that's our gauge, not scripture, but our ourselves. And then Eli with his son Phineas, and I forgot the other son's name, what man. But uh, Eli was, I always thought, was one of the most pathetic people in scripture because he was always in the house of the Lord continually, but never knowing the Lord. That's interesting. He didn't have a relationship with him. He didn't know him. And eventually he paid for that. So, well, how many people are in church that don't know him? Yeah. yeah. That was Eli. He was, was the me. priest. That was me before. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought by going to church, I was a Christian. I met an old Baptist preacher once uh, from down in Texas that John remembers him. And he said, somebody asked me once if I, if I believe and the raising of the dead. He says, I'm not sure about that, but I preach to him every Sunday. <laughs> uh, we'll have a prayer, and then Dennis can lead us and take us through an omniscience of God. Wow. Father, thank you this morning, Father. Thank you for our classes we do every day. Uh, like I, I thought the other week, we take some things as routine, but we should be grateful <laughs> grateful that we can get gathered together in your word this morning. So bless us, prepare our minds, prepare our hearts.
that we would receive teaching this morning. Thank you for uh, Dr. Lawson. Thank you for our, our teachers and his father. And that's the blessing on this. Well, um, I had opportunity, and I'll share this with you. Um, it's a little relevant to what was just said. Um, I had the opportunity on Tuesday to meet Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy is a. Uh, Tony is. Well, he was here in Charlotte, and uh, they didn't have to fly me anywhere to meet him. Uh, he was here in Charlotte, and uh, F people got a chance to uh, have a meet and greet with him, as they say. And so he talked for about an hour, um, and no boring word came out of his mouth. <laughs> it was, it was, something. but he talked about his own life and how he grew up in the church, how he had Christian parents, <clears throat> but it wasn't until he got to the Steelers. And Donnie Shell was his roommate. That Donnie uh, Donnie Shell was a, also on the Steelers. Um, and um, uh, Donnie Shell was a defensive back. They were moving Dungy from quarterback to defensive back, so they roomed him with Donnie Shell uh, to teach him. But when he got in the room, Donnie Shell, when they met Donnie Shell, said, "Well, what are you reading?" He said, "Well, I'm reading the playbook so I can learn, you know, how to be a defensive back." He said, "But what are you reading?" <laughs> And Don Michelle used to get up in the morning and read his Bible. He would go to bed and read the Bible during the day. So he was getting Tony to read the Bible. And he said it was through Don Michelle that he realized, because he said, growing people would look at me and they'd say, boy, there's a, there's a guy, there's a nice guy, he's got great character. He said, the one word that never came into the description was Christian. So it was while he was with the Steelers and, and uh, with one shell that it was like, and of course, we know that he has had a tremendous impact. Um, and, and there's there's things that we don't get publicly that uh, that that he uh, has been involved in and, and worked with. So uh, it was it was a great time. Um, I, I didn't miss. I would like to be. Yeah, he was. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, he was. Um, it was in a business park uh, where the uh, Target is in uh, in, in the Huntersville Target in Cole, uh, right there. And there's a business park way down behind it that I admit it's it's hidden almost from from the public. Uh, it was it was down there, and he was in town to uh, speak at some kind of a fundraiser or something. I guess. So, but it was it was good. He was uh, he was he was challenging as as he spoke. It was, you know, it was a real challenge. Well, the omnipotence of God. Right away, this will not work. Maybe it's not there. Don't know. It never wants to work until I do this. Well. That doesn't want to work. There we go. Um, uh, here's what Augustine of Hippo. Uh, but however strong may be the purposes, either of angels or of men, whether of good or bad, whether the, uh, these purposes fall in with the will of God or run counter to it, the will of the omnipotent is never defeated. The will of the omnipotent is never defeated. So, and here we go. We come now in this session to the second omni attribute of God. Last time we considered the omnipresence of God, that God is everywhere present. This time we want to consider the omniscience of God, which means that God is all knowing. This is another staggering truth about God that makes Him incomprehensible to us, really. I mean, we understand what this means, but the magnitude of this is overwhelming to us that there is nothing that God does not know. And by this truth, we mean that God possesses all knowledge in His mind. Uh, he possesses infinite knowledge of the past, the present, and the future. God never learns anything. He certainly never learns anything from us. 
Uh, nothing new ever enters God's mind. Nothing ever suddenly dawns on God. Nothing ever catches Him off guard. God never has a eureka moment. He knows all things in advance. He knows what we will say before we even say it. He knows all things eternally, perfectly, immediately, comprehensively. This is the omniscience of God. Now, as we consider this, I want to lay this out in eight headings. Don't faint. Eight headings. They'll be short. But we want to consider something of the height and the depth and the breadth and the length of the omniscience of God. First of all, when we say the omniscience of God, He has perfect self-knowledge. Uh, God knows Himself perfectly. Um, he knows Himself intimately. And within the Godhead, the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father perfectly. Uh, in Matthew 11, verse 27, Jesus says, "...no one knows the Son except the Father." Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Within the Trinity, there is this perfect knowledge one of the other, and it speaks to the unity, the perfect unity that exists within the Godhead. In John 10, verse 15, Jesus makes this simple statement, "...the Father knows me, and I know the Father." There are no gaps in their understanding of each other. Um, sometimes um, I fail to say things to my wife that I should communicate but don't, and there can be gaps of information. Sometimes I know something that I haven't told her. She knows something that she has not told me, and therefore we can at times... Uh, pull against one another in making plans, little realizing what we're doing. But the Father knows the Son, and the Son knows the Father, and it speaks to the perfect harmony and unity that exists as they carry out their administration over all of the affairs of providence. There are no gaps in their understanding with what one is doing while the other is doing this in their distinction of roles. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11 says, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. No one really knows the depths of what God knows except the Spirit and except the Son. So we begin at this very profound <clears throat> entry level into omniscience that they know each other perfectly. Second, they have perfect knowledge. And not only does God know Himself perfectly, but He knows all things outside of Himself perfectly. God knows everything accurately as it really is. God never misreads a situation. There's never a misperception with God. Uh, Job 37, verse 16, speaks of God as perfect in knowledge. Did you get that? Perfect in knowledge. Psalm 147, verse 5, His understanding is infinite. There, there is no limit to the understanding, the perfection of God's understanding. He knows everything perfectly, infinitely, 1 John 1, 5, God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. One, that speaks to His holiness. Two, that also speaks to His omniscience, for light is a, a metaphor used in the Scripture of knowledge. There is no darkness in the knowledge of God. What a comfort this should be to us as we trust God um, with the affairs of our lives, that God knows what's around the corner. God sees what I don't see. God knows the best answer to the prayers that I bring before Him. God takes everything into account 
as I lay before Him my petitions and my requests. We can even say praise God for unanswered prayer. Think about the prayers that you and I have prayed, little realizing what God knows and what lies around the corner. But God knew and God protected us from ourselves because He has perfect knowledge. Third, He has eternal knowledge. That is to say, everything that God knows, which is everything, He has known from before the foundation of the world. There has not been a succession of acquired knowledge by God along the way. You and I started off in kindergarten. We received some knowledge. Then we moved up to first grade, received a little more knowledge. Second, third, it built, it uh, kept escalating upward. Not with God. God has always known everything from before the foundation of the world. Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10, I've already read it in an earlier session, but so many of these verses speak to various attributes of God, and and it shows how overlapping Many of these character qualities of God are. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Now, what defines God as saying, there is no one like me? What sets God apart as God, that there is no one like Him? Well, there's a sense in which each of these attributes set God apart, that there is no one like Him. But what follows now in the next verse, specifically in this context, sets God apart from us as being totally different from what we are. I am God and there is no one like me. Now here it is, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times those things which have not been done. God can stand at the beginning and does stand at the beginning and has stood at the beginning and looks all the way to the end, to the very end, and declares what the end will be. And by implication in everything in between, if you can declare the end, you know everything that leads up to the end. And all of this from The beginning, all of this from ancient times. What confidence we should have in our God that He has known all that He knows from eternity past. Fourth, it is immediate knowledge. By that we mean that God knows everything simultaneously. He knows everything immediately, or he knows everything at once. He never has to calculate something to discover the bottom line. He already knows the bottom line. He already knows everything. He knows the whole process. He knows the end. He knows the means to the end, and he knows the end all at once. He never forgets something and then remembers He never adds to his knowledge. There is nothing ever subtracted from his knowledge. He does not know some things better than other things. He knows everything perfectly, immediately, eternally. Romans 11, verses 33 and following, we keep citing this text. It's kind of a one-size-fits-all text. It addresses virtually every attribute of God, seems to, one way or another. I love verses like this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It's a bottomless depth, the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. Unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? It's another rhetorical question. The answer is not you or me, not anyone. 
Or who became his counselor? Who knew something that God didn't know that needed to instruct God, that needed to counsel God, that needed to give God insight into something that God did not previously have? The answer is no one. Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? The answer is no one. No one has ever been God's informant. No one has ever brought a report to the throne of grace that he needed to receive this information that he did not already have. God is a know-it-all. God knows everything. Isaiah 40, verse 13. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult? And who gave him understanding? Again, these are all rhetorical questions. Begging the answer, no one. And who taught him in the path of justice? And taught him knowledge. Who taught him knowledge? And informed him of the way of understanding. This will revolutionize our prayer life. Uh, when we pray to God, we're not informing him of what's going on down here. Uh, as though he did not know, he's been preoccupied with some other matters, and, and now he's ready to attend to us. This is our moment to come before the throne of grace, and we are giving insider information now to God. No, we don't have to pray that way, because God already knows it all. Fifth, it's exhaustive knowledge which is to say God knows everything down to the smallest detail. God numbers and names all of the stars, the number of which is incalculable. He numbers every hair upon our heads. Not even a sparrow falls apart from the Lord's knowledge. He sees all the actions of men in every place. He views all the paths that we trod, the works that we accomplish. God sees it all. I've quoted A.W. Tozier a couple of times. Let me quote him one more time. God knows all that can be known. God knows all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas. <laughs> all feeling, all desires, every unuttered secret. Because God knows all things perfectly, He knows no thing better than any other thing, but all things equally well. He never discovers anything. He is never surprised. He is never amazed by what He learns. Because He never learns. He already knows. You can't learn what you already know despite what your wife may tell you. <laughs> Psalm 33, beginning in verse 13. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From His dwelling place, He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all. He who understands all their works. He understands their works. He understands their heart and their motives and their ambitions behind their works. He sees it all. Psalm 147, verse 4, He counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. That's impossible for us. Proverbs 5, 21, For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. He watches all his paths. Psalm 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. How exhaustive is the knowledge of God. Every minute detail. Again, this is comforting. It is convicting. It is comforting in that He knows me and my heart and even when others misunderstand me and there is 
a mistaken perception about me. God knows the truth. That is encouraging. But that's also very convicting as well because other times men think more highly of us than we ought to think. God knows the truth. Sixth, His knowledge is penetrating. God sees what no man can see. God sees through walls. God sees through uh, the outward facade. God sees through the masks that we wear. God sees the things that are done in darkness. God sees into the depths of the human heart. God knows the motives. God knows what is truly there. Of course, 1 Samuel 16, 7 Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Now, God does see the outward appearance, but God plunges yet deeper. God sees into the secret places of our heart. God sees it all. He knows it all. In fact, it could be said, not only does He see into us, He sees through us. He sees us so perfectly. Perhaps the signature text of all of this is Psalm 139, a psalm which we've already quoted. It's one of these omni-psalms. But the first four verses, they just so stand out. Listen to these verses. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. This word searched was used of the spies going into the promised land to search it out firsthand, to have their hands upon the terrain and to look and to come back and to give a report. So God has explored every little niche within us. This word search means to spy out. It means to dig deeply into a matter. Uh, The idea is to explore a, a country, for example. God has searched me and known me. This also speaks highly of His love for us in that He knows the worst about us and still loves us. Sometimes when I'm criticized as a pastor, yes, sometimes that does happen in the ministry, I I really have the thought, I'm glad they don't know any (laughs) more. If they knew any more, they would really be upset with me. I'm glad that's as far as you go, okay? Um, But God has searched us out. He, He knows the worst about us. He knows our secret thoughts. He knows our selfishness. He knows our ego. And yet, He has set is eternal love upon us, and it is blazing, and it will never be extinguished, and many waters shall not drown it out. You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down. This word for know means to know intimately. It's the word that's used really of the relationship between a husband and a wife and their intimate physical relationship. It's as intimate and close as it can possibly be. The psalmist David says, you know, you know me intimately and personally, up close. When I sit down and when I rise up. Now, that's a figure of speech, a way of saying the entirety of my life. When I sit down and when I rise up, that's like saying, preach the word in season and out of season. Well, there's no other season. (laughs) I mean, that just means to always preach the Word of God. In season and out of season, there's not another category, is there? You know me perfectly when I sit down and when I rise up. You know the whole of my life. You understand my thought from afar. God, even upon your throne in heaven, you peer with penetrating insight and knowledge into the depths of my soul and my life. He goes on to say, you scrutinize my path. This word scrutinize is the word that means to sift through something, to separate out, to sift through and separate out the wheat from the tares, the good from the bad. 
the temporal from the eternal, God is able to sift through and scrutinize the entirety of my life. He says, you scrutinize my path and my lying down. When I sit down, when I rise up, when I lie down. I I think that covers all the categories, unless we can fly. (laughs) And you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all. It's an amazing thing. Nobody knows me like this. I I would be uncomfortable for anyone to know me like this. You, You would love me from afar, but if you got too close, there's plenty of flaws within me. This would make any of us uncomfortable to be known like this by another person on the earth. Yet this is exactly how God knows us perfectly. Psalm 139 verse 12, Even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. God can see even in the dark. That's pretty good. I just need to give you the last two categories. He knows the future. He has future knowledge. You would understand that, of course. The the entire second half of the book of Isaiah is just to compare the dumb idols who know nothing and God who sees the future. And the test of the one true God is that He can predict the future and knows the future. And the reason God knows the future is because God has foreordained the future. And then finally, possible knowledge. God even knows what possibly could happen if another path had been taken. And the text I want you to hear is Matthew eleven twenty one 21 and 23. He says, Woe unto you, Chorazin, woe unto you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon had occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Process that verse. If the miracles that happened over there, that had happened here, they would have repented long ago. But it was not God's sovereign will that they happened over there. God knows not only the reality of what what there is, but also the possibility of other things. I need to bring this to a close. Our God is all-knowing, vastly more so than what any of us can comprehend. Is it better to look for you now? No, I don't say. Okay. We need it on. Okay. It's just when the video is playing. It's just when the video is playing. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about. I want to know how you pray. Yeah. Well, see, I think that one of the things that we don't realize about prayer, and well, we know it, but we we don't apply it as well as we should, is that it's conversation. It's conversation. It's like you and I talking. It's that's that's what it is, and we tend to want to make prayer supplication all the time we want to uh we want to go to god and say hey do this for me or do this for this person or do this and that is because we want to get god's we want to be on the same page as god okay but i don't think we spend as much time in adoration as much time in confession um, supplication and thanksgiving supplication take uh, precedence. Even in our prayer meetings, we tend in our prayer meetings to uh, be supplicating, you know, praying for the country, praying for the, these things, rather than the the intimate conversation that you can have with somebody. Um, you need to have that with God. And how do we get to know somebody in our lives? Well, for the most part, we start through conversation. We start spend through. time. Yeah, yeah. So.
So I think uh, your question very well. It's just so hard. I guess I, maybe I brought him down to my level rather than to look up to him. And as it's so hard for me to know that he already knows. And, and then why should we talk to him about it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, but you know what? Marilyn probably knows everything, and I still talk to her about it. <laughs> I think Dennis is it right. We, we tend to, he says, come, and we sit down, and we, we think we get down, we know all we have is ritual, we go to our father. He knows every inch of our life. And, and, and we pour, it's like your wife and a husband, you pour out your life, what you, but this, your, this is your father. You say, I'm sorry, I did it, or I got, it yeah. Yeah. But, but it's, a, it's a talking thing. Yeah, yeah. and even, even with, your, with your earthly father, right. your conversation there is, you know, I mean, we should be telling our, we should be telling those that we're, that, that, that we're, and uh, of our family that we care for them, that we love them, we should we should in a sense be hallowing them. Okay. But, but on the same token, we don't want to feel like Charlie Brown if we walk in cold church. We are going before our heaven, right? Like, like you want right. to go for the King of England, but right. still you bring it down where it's a conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so, uh, so we, so even in our conversations with each other, we tend we tend and should probably have the same while where we talk to each other and what are we supposed we're supposed to pray for our wife aren't we praise her and 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 as we praise her when your husband praises you i'm, I'm sure he does i hear i hear it means something to you and it draws you closer yeah and it draws you closer even after what you've been married what 30 years uh, 31. <laughs> well, and, and, uh, 30, 30. Yeah, because we don't know the fullness of God's uh, grace and mercy towards us. Yep. We really don't know that fullness because he knows exactly who we are, and yet he still talks to us or wants us to be near him. Yep. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I mean, you have, it's almost like an you know, you really you say something wrong or whatever, but God still in his mercy and grace wants to draw you to his eternal love. And that to me blows my mind because it's like, Lord, I'm just like dirt. Yes. And I don't mean that as a as like a deprecation kind of thing yeah. for me. I feel pretty good about myself, but maybe too good about myself. That's my point. And it's like we don't understand how great that mercy is. This is yeah. it's so incredibly awesome. Every time I read Psalm 139, yeah, it makes me realize just how really you know he he knows me, he knows the worst of me, yet he still wants to draw me into his eternal love. That is unbelievable. Yeah. So I, I don't think, think we got the fullness. Right? I think he's given us an, an example as parents to new children. Okay, you have the, the little child come to you and ask for six bags of candy. Mm -hmm. Your wisdom knows that's not good for the child because you know the teeth and uh, diabetes and all that. So in a, in a very minor sense, there is that relationship between parent and child that replicates relationship to God. I mean, not that we're omniscient, but we do know, we do have wisdom and do know yeah. that you don't ride your skateboard on yeah. Route 77. Did, uh, did, did you guys ever know of Jim Leckie? Does that mean right now? Youth Guidance Incorporated. I think I've heard of Yeah, heard of uh, Youth Guidance was a uh, sort of a big brother program in the Pittsburgh area that was really effective. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim Leckie was the founder of it. And I heard him say this in, in relationship, that when a little child comes and would ask the mom, uh, you know, uh, what is, mom should be able to answer and say, God is like your father. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Now we see that work out in a negative way in broken families, don't we? Because when there's a father there, there's nobody to be that model, that person that is is loving from a fatherly way. So, so, uh, and then, then, uh, then when uh, when a little child would ask, and these are questions that we probably from our children or from somebody's children, what is heaven like? And Jim said, the answer to that should be heaven is like our family. Uh huh. Yeah, heaven is like our family. And what happened in our house when they would squabble at dinner time, or, you know, pick up the, I said, you know, this family is a training ground for heaven, and if heaven is like this, I really don't want to go. <laughs> 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 so, so to answer your question, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of things like that that are uh, that are out there, and, and, and so as we as we go through, and let's let's look uh, let's look really quickly. Uh, you guys all have the list there of the things that he meant, uh, and, and self knowledge. Knowledge. Uh, I'm sorry. Perfect self knowledge. Perfect knowledge, eternal knowledge, immediate knowledge, exhaustive knowledge, penetrating knowledge, future knowledge, and possible knowledge. Which one of those do you sort of, are, are there any of those that you tend to migrate more than another as you, as you consider them? <laughs> what would I like his future knowledge. Future knowledge. Um, I, I'm, I don't usually like his exhaustive knowledge, <laughs> but I like his future knowledge because there's some. Well, just think about COVID. If we look at all the different variations of knowledge that we're getting, mm -hmm. and there is truth. It, I mean, whether you wear a mask or a mask, is it true that it actually helps you, right. or is it not? Right. We don't know that. We've got all different experts. And right. Same way with the, the um, shots and stuff. Yeah. The long-term effects of the shots. Yeah. So anyway, but yeah, I, I do like his future knowledge. Uh, because I feel you know, no that. matter what, no matter what they say about masks, no matter what they say about the vaccination, no matter <laughs> what is said about anything, about the economy, about anything, you know that the future is in God's hands, but not only in the sense he knows it. It's not just in his hands, but he knows it. And he's designed yeah. it. Yeah. And the trouble is, we don't we don't give him the credit. Oh no, no, no we have no. to do our thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think future knowledge was uh, so. Uh, if uh, there's you're talking about categories of prayer, and I completely agree with what you're, we tend always to have intercessory in prayer. But one of the categories of prayer is inquiry. So a person who knows, understands that God knows all things. And in knowing that, God has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. So we inquire and ask mm -hmm. God to give us the wisdom so that we can stay on track with what his plan and purpose is. In other words, Lord, don't let me be stupid and take a side I have to backtrack all the way back. Give me wisdom to understand which way to go. So yeah. it's a prayer of inquiry. Yeah. What do I do, Lord? What, do I do this? Do I do that? Do I do this? What do, what's, your, what's your wisdom for that? Yeah. And that's where that battle is. If you have a big decision, you think, "My way, be going." What do you? I still want to do it my way. It's a battle. Well, the classic one is Yogi Bear. Yeah, when you come to a fork, take it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, who was that? The <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I do that all the time. So, yeah. Lord, you know, you know me. You know my final heartbeat and all that. You have a, even at this stage of the game. Should I do this? Should I go to Sheer? Is that where you want me to go? Here, should I do that? And uh, that's where, where I just love it. I, I don't forget his question number What is your only comfort within life and death? And that, that is, yeah. that's a, that's a good one. Well, I like the fact that uh, he has eternal knowledge, that he knows the outcome of history. He already knows. Yep. And I don't have to stress about it. Um, I, I can participate, but basically it's it's his show. Yep. It's, his, it's his story. And uh, that brings a great deal of comfort 
to know that God is in control. And we are, but we're really not. We can participate, but he's actually in complete control. Yeah. Yeah, and I just saw that uh, I think seven missionaries just vanished in Haiti. Mm. Uh, and you wonder why those people were chosen to be uh, persecuted. And here we are living in that bloodshed. We eat with our belly over the pool. Well, that goes under the category of perfect knowledge. God knows perfectly yeah. why. And right. we're, we're looking at things mm -hmm. in and retrospect. We, and, and, you know, God knows. Knows. and will we will we have the courage of that Ridley? 17 missionaries this morning in Haiti were kidnapped. Is that now, these are a group of people that went on a short-term mission from churches in May to an orphanage. They're kidnapped now by a gang, men, women, and children. And why is it less? Well, God is going to use that to some purpose. You know, um, when you think about that, um, there's, a, there's an opportunity. We think of the negative of that. Mm -hmm. The opportunity there is for who has not heard the gospel mm -hmm. to hear it. Yeah, not only really hear it, see it experienced. Sure. See it experienced. There are countless, countless tales of jailers who have seen uh, people uh, being put in prison for their faith and them coming to faith. Look at the Philippian jail. Yeah. What was yeah. the missionary dentist that, that, that uh, he was killed? In and, Elliot. And then you know, the, the uh, one that killed. Could, could, could oh, that was uh, Elliot. 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 Yeah. He Elliot. is no fool to give up essentially yeah, what he has yeah. to gain, what he can never lose. Yeah. So the one that killed him, he, he finally came to Christ. Yeah. He can bring all his death. He killed him. Can we go over these questions? Well, let me, let me get uh, Bob, do you have one of those that you, one of the uh, categories there? That he listed that you probably oh, all no well <laughs> I could go over them all but... I never okay uh, Mary did you have one okay to me it'll go well okay so one that the one that grabbed my attention was penetrating on that he knows me oh. yeah in the depths of who I am yeah. In the depths of who I am, he knows that thought that I have. He knows that those things, and that that's the one. And it scares me <laughs> that he knows us. You know, it scares me that the, that um, as I've matured, I think, as I've matured in my life, I have not made a lot of my thoughts known because I'm controlling my life more. And he knows that thought. You don't know that, but he does. And you've heard, you heard him saying, we all have thoughts that we shame him. Yeah. You think about that. Absolutely. And you can't really control your thoughts. They, they just sort of yeah. project yeah. in. Yeah. The are, you know, and, and they come from a center. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like somebody will walk in that door. And maybe uh, Bob walks in. Oh, no, I can't say anything about those socks, can I? <laughs> He's got his penguin socks on. But he wears some socks that he would walk in and say, Why is he wearing those socks? <laughs> and, 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 the thing is, and the thing is, what, what we do in that door, what do we do? We judge them. Yeah, we make a judgment. Oh, yeah. We make a judgment just about every time. We will say, Wow, I really like what they're wearing. Or right. their hair looks really nice today. Right. Or boy, they shouldn't have gotten that hair out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> and so and the greater oh, mind blowing one. You know, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I mean, go ahead. The greater one, and this goes along with the reform theology and the golden chain of salvation, God had foreknowledge. So I did research on that, okay? What it means is before you existed, before you had being, before the moment of conception, God knew you totally from eternity. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So he knew Mary before Mary had being, before you existed. He knew you in 
and they who you were. I had one. I walked. I, I walked into the principal's office, and it wasn't because I was bad. Um, but I went in to see her and hope well. And I looked. I, I walked in, and I, I just said to her, "You really look tired." I judged it. Judgment. And she said, "Oh, and I've got a headache." <laughs> and, I, and so we prayed together. We had good conversation. We we encouraged each other. By the time we were done, she said her headache was fine. I always tell everybody, you're confused, ugly, but tired. <laughs> I, I have been drafted to a, a breach. Okay. <laughs> I turned this over to Jim. Now it's become general. <laughs> 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 you said just, doesn't it? <laughs> shallow and superficial Christianity is in the main culture, whereas Christianity is, we need to study it. Oh, yeah, and it's, it, and it's, and it's, it's, there's depth to it that, yes. that generally people who, and, you know, we're talking a lot of times just about non-believers, and non-believers don't get the depth of it, but even some believers don't get the depth of it because they haven't studied it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, the whole the whole thing of being reformed is studying. Mm -hmm. It's studying so that the Holy Spirit can work in you and bring you to to what we think is the right doctrine. And the media pushes yeah. the uh, refrain rather than. Um, how should the fact that only God has perfect self knowledge influence how we come to know Him? With fear and trembling. Yeah. Well, I think we talked about that as we pray. You know, with with the aspect of praying. And making prayer the conversation it needs to be. I just I don't I don't think I pray well. I don't, I don't think I, I don't think I don't talk to him. I don't I don't talk to him and maybe try to figure out what he's saying to me. You know, trying to figure out what he's saying to me. And the only way that happens is how how do we really have a conversation with God? We go to him and we say, open your word, God. Let us study your word. And that's that's how that that uh, that can happen. Can we come to know him through our own efforts? No. Well, in a sense, we have to have the effort to study. Well, I, when we come to know, I think that's talking about our initial uh, coming to him. So can we do that on our own? No, we can't do that on our own. Uh, he has figured out, because we can't have this knowledge that he has. Dr. Lawson stresses that nothing ever catches God off guard. How does this bring relief to Christians in difficult circumstances? Your circumstances didn't catch God off guard. You're in a circumstance because he won't. And you're, you're confident in him. He's yeah. in control. I guess it's yeah. not good yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things, you know, what, one of R.C.'s most famous is what? Molecule. The, yeah. There's no uh, rogue molecule in the universe, you know. Um, and so so true. That is so true because there's, there's nothing that's outside of his control. And we try to be it's in control is not the truth yeah this is a good time of year to watch at a particular moment it left its mooring on the branch because god ordained it yeah it had its trajectory to come down and it landed precisely where it's it supposed to and you look at the multitude of leaves and and you look now i, I don't know if any of you've watched that uh, space things no going on. But they now bring the rocket in on land and it lands like it was. I don't know if any of you remember Captain Video. Oh, yeah. Remember Captain Video on the TV? Yeah. Or you know, any of those that the spaceship came down and landed where for the longest time we couldn't do that. We would maybe bring the capsule in on land, but not the rocket. And it's coming down and it's not coming down with a parachute, it's coming down with its rocket engines, letting it down easily. And you said you talk about the leaf landing. <laughs> it has taken years for, for the development of the rocket to come down that way. That's Elon Musk. 
Yeah, yeah. He did that. You know, I watched that thought with Shat. It was like emotional. It was like he just, you know, somebody said, don't understand emotional. He's been in space all his life. <laughs> Does the fact that he knows everything provide comfort by itself or does comfort considering his knowledge together with other attributes? What other attributes? Does he think he knows everything? That's comfort in itself. Yep. But um, because if he didn't know. Nothing is out of control. In him, nothing is out of control. We look at chaos, but we're in him, we're in Christ, and he's in him. Yeah. When we talk about the attributes, the other attributes here, we're talking about his, his uh, uh, um, love, grace, grace, and those things. So does his knowledge, uh, with, together with the attributes, does that comfort us? Sure. <laughs> yeah, right. Sure, it comforts He said it in a way. Intimate. Yeah. Yep. There's an intimacy. Since God knows ahead of time what we ask of him in prayer, what is accomplished by prayer? Yeah, that's a big one. Seems yeah. number one, we're commanded to pray. Well, that's the big that. issue. Yeah. That's the big issue. And also but, but, but again, we go back to what is prayer. When we look at Jesus praying and we see what see the words that he used. He was conversing. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't it wasn't this thing of, of you know, and, and, and you know, when you think about it, um, uh, you know, uh, there's liturgies that are prayers, and you know, we pray the Lord's Prayer every week, and we're not praying it, we're just saying it. You know, I just just saw some about worshiping God and how things some worship can be repugnant to him. I'm wondering if it's repugnant when we just read the verse, read the read the prayer as opposed to pray. Well, every part is different, and he knows yeah. the parts. Yeah. So, but th there's peace in praying because you're to be anxious for nothing. I can get anxious about having uh, white yeah. white flies on this area. So <laughs> that's something on my rose of Sharon. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's silly. I know it's silly, but that's how. Yeah, but you know what? They're dead. <laughs> it's been a three-year battle, but I'm getting better. We get them every year, and I just spray them. But at the end of the year, they get they, they, these bikes come out, and they just are a hundred. Doctor Lawson states that God's uh, exhaustive knowledge is both comforting and convicting. In what ways is it comforting, and in what way is it convicting? Well. Um, it's exhaustive, so it's all encompassing. And so, if it's all encompassing, that's a, that's what should be the comfort to us. Um, but it's also convicting <laughs> because it is so exhaustive. Yeah. But he says, "Be anxious for nothing." I always go back to that because it, it helps. Okay, so that's slide in there twice. Uh, who is able to perfectly understand reality? God alone. Yeah. How does God gain knowledge? <laughs> he doesn't. No. <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah. There it is. Yes, he that's does. right. That's right. What does God's immediate knowledge primarily refer to? Immediate knowledge. That one's hard to watch. He knows everything at once. Yeah, uh, yes, he knows his simultaneous knowledge of everything. You know, this. That's a hard word. Yeah, it's. We sort of might think of it differently than what it's being thought of here, because we'll think of oh, immediately God has knowledge, but it's the all surrounding knowledge. It's immediate. How exhaustive is God's knowledge? A, 
knows hey, everything. Yeah, he knows everything without exception. How does God know everything that has happened and what will happen? Yeah, that's the answer. That's the one. He's foreordained it. Who can know God perfectly? Only the triune God. That's why we see it. You know, just the last thing that uh, uh, the the, um, the reason for God's knowledge, where it comes from, is is for knowledge. Because and um, we tend to use this word in a sense that it's because he knows it, but it's this really is he planned it. He planned it. And we need to keep that in mind. We we might want to misuse the word for knowledge. Okay, because that who did that? Who's done that? Who does that today? There are many. There are many. They look down and yeah. 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 It's not like that. It's because he planned for that to happen, not because he saw that it or he sees that it's going to happen. And do you know what is terrifying? Nobody escapes. That's a real no. I mean, we are held captive. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody escapes from whatever his yeah. judgment is. Well, how about we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, um, we thank you that you are a God of knowledge, that you are a God of all knowledge, not just some knowledge, just not what you're learning today or what you learned yesterday. It's because you, in your infinite wisdom, have planned everything. So, Lord, we're thankful for that. You've even planned today what's going to happen in our worship service. You have planned today the words that Steve's going to preach. You've planned the songs that we're going to sing, even though we as people have put those things together. Yes. You plan them, and we thank you for that. And we pray because of that word that as we come to worship you, our hearts might be in tune with that, that, that our very being might be in tune with the fact that you, worshiping you is something that you have actually ordained us to do, preordained us to do, preplanned it. So Lord, be with us now, and uh, we praise you and we thank you for all the good that you bring to us and even when things are bad, it's really good. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I made a judgment then about the Kentucky, about the Tennessee fans. Oh, I heard, I, I saw something. They threw golf balls. <laughs> they do throw golf balls at the players. Uh, I can't hear anything, just want to the coach of the uh, Old Miss. Well, that used to be the coach of Tennessee. And they did something really bad. And so, thanks for watching. Well, so, golf balls are.